if there's one thing I encourage everyone watching this video to keep in mind right up through to the end, it's that I'm not an anime expert by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I've only been investing myself in anime in recent years. This is not a list of my 10 favorite anime of all time, but rather just the ones I've really enjoyed from what I've seen so far. So instead of posting the obligatory, why wasn't insert anime here on the list, please remember that I most likely have not seen it yet, so I have no opinion on it yet. I do plan to watch more, and I already have some ideas of what I'm going to watch next, but just because I haven't seen that one particular anime that you love, doesn't mean I hate it or that I'm not going to watch it and try to recognize the greatness within it for myself. I probably will get around to watching it eventually. Emphasis on eventually. The entire reason this list took so long to make was because I was essentially still playing catch up and trying to binge watch enough content to have 10 entries at all. And even then, I just barely made it. I had to hurry up and finish one of them just so I'd have enough to say for one of these entries. So instead of actively searching for shows you know and love while watching this list, please just try and enjoy what's already here, okay? Also, differences of opinions and all that, and if you're going to comment just to tell me I mispronounced something, which I am certain I will do, trust me, I already know. Let's get started. Dead Man Wonderland This anime is incredibly dark. That's the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Dead Man Wonderland. It's incredibly gruesome, mature, shocking, and it can twist your mental innocence into a pretzel if you let it. I can see where the appeal for this show came from, and I was drawn into it for the very same reason. You might argue that it's so dark it's edgy and therefore worthy of being mocked for that, but I would say that the reason this show is so dark isn't because of its somber color palette, but rather just because of the pervading sense I get when I'm watching it that, no matter what these characters do, there is no happy ending for them so anyone's efforts to change the situation in any capacity are all meaningless, but if they didn't still try, I would have nothing to watch. This overwhelming feeling of hopelessness and despair comes across as dominant, yet never so much so to the point where I view it as a problem or something begging to be made fun of. Dead Man Wonderland has incredible production value through its runtime, so it's very appealing to watch at all times. Whether I'm sitting through a slower scene of characters standing around in the shadows conversing, or one where the action really ramps up the story's pace up to full throttle. This anime also has a really enticing premise. The setting, plot points, and characters are fleshed out just enough to be satisfying, and then it all just kind of stops abruptly. The series is only 13 episodes, and that's problematic because it takes the time to set up this really engaging story and all these characters whom I really wanted to know everything about, and it just felt like when things were really starting to get good, Boom. The ending comes out of literally nowhere and that's it. What keeps this anime from climbing any higher than the 10th spot on my list is that it ends way too soon, and because of that, I feel like it didn't get to grow and shine to its full potential. I really loved how it just came out swinging by starting with a full-on classroom slaughtering, leading to a rapid downward spiral in lead protagonist Ganta's life until he's dropped right into the hell on earth prison known as Dead Man Wonderland and watching him pick himself up from there. Ganta himself can be a bit whiny and edgy as a character, and at first it's understandable given just what he's been through in the first act. But after a while it starts to get old, as he very slowly takes steps to get over his trauma and deal with his current situation. Despite that, the supporting cast, especially the albino Shiro, work to balance out Ganta's edginess and the overwhelmingly dark tone of the show itself with their interesting personalities, abilities, and histories. I think the idea of using blood as a projectile is a very interesting concept that shows promise for creating dynamic and interesting action scenes, but like just about everything else about this show, I wish it had more time to develop and grow. It's a shame that it's unlikely for Dead Man Wonderland to ever get a second season or any other kind of continuation, because I really think it had a lot going for it over the course of its 13 episodes. If it had been given more time to shine, it probably could have evolved into something even greater. But then again, I hear the manga is better anyway, so there's that. Your Lie in April This is a weird one. I don't mean the anime itself is weird. Granted, its humor doesn't always make the most sense. I just mean the story of how I even came to watching it is weird. 
My very first exposure to Your Lie in April was through a cover medley of the openings and endings done by a YouTuber named Lian Lai. I liked what I was hearing, even though I was not yet familiar with this anime, and for some reason, all the comments on that video were talking about how sad the ending was. I was curious, so I watched it. Your Lie in April is a sort of slice-of-life anime, with musical performance being one of the driving themes of the plot, accompanied by a steadily developing romance between the two main leads, I'm probably going to butcher their names and I'm sorry about this, Kosei and Kaori. There are other characters too, but in the grand scheme of things they're just not as important, honestly. Kosei was raised to play the piano like a child prodigy by his terminally ill, abusive mother. He was taught to play the music exactly as it was written, nothing more, nothing less, and without any emotion whatsoever. He played and played because he thought it would make his mother happy and help her get better. But she didn't. In fact, his mother died, and Kosei was so distraught by that event that it ruined his ability to play the piano altogether. His hearing was just fine, but he could no longer hear the music he was playing. Kosei grew up very detached from the world. He saw everything in monochrome and questioned the purpose of everything in it, until the faithful day he met the violinist, Kaori. Kaori was full of so much life, so much spirit, joy, energy, and passion that Kosei couldn't help but feel fascinated by her. As a fellow performer, Kaori goes out of her way to help Kosei climb out of his shell, out of the darkness he had been trapped in for so long. She helps him see the beauty of life, of the world around him, and the magic that music brings to people. I know the way I describe this show sounds pretty cheesy, but I honestly can't think of any other way to describe it other than artistic. There's so much imagery, symbolism, and faint foreshadowing in the visuals of this anime. The musical performances themselves are not just 10 minutes of watching someone play an instrument. The performers have visions, their emotions take shape, their monologues are practically screaming with emotions and thoughts. There's no action in this series whatsoever, but these performances get so intense and visually breathtaking that I can't help but watch it. I guess I got into this anime because I can relate to Kosei to an extent. Learning to be social and just enjoy the beautiful simplicity of life have been some of my greatest challenges growing up as well. Of course, I never had a tragic backstory with an abusive mother or anything, but still. I've met girls like Kaori myself, so I can relate to what Kosei was thinking and feeling, and why. The two are such drastic contrasts of one another, and yet slowly but surely, they attract. The entire structure of this anime is watching Kosei evolve as a character, and all the ways that Kaori brings out the best in him. It really is touching. Your Lie in April does have some flaws, of course, so it isn't perfect. There is a lot, and a lot, and a lot of monologuing. There's so much time spent in the characters' heads that it starts to feel unnatural or out of place when they're conversing with each other. Of course, I do recognize that the monologues are a critical piece in understanding how characters like Kosei grow, but I did find myself at times wishing the plot would speed it up a little. Primarily when characters would repeat a word or phrase seven to eight times in a row. It's like, I get it. I get how you're feeling right at that second. Okay, I get it. Move on already. Say something else. Also, the show's sense of humor is a bit weird at times, with Kaori being physical and violent with Kosei. It's played up for comedic effect, as is typically done in anime, but since Kosei was tragically abused by his own mother, having someone else do it and trying to make it funny just kind of comes off as mean-spirited to me. Lastly, like I said before, Kosei and Kaori are the only real characters in the show. There are others, but they're not explored nearly enough to really convince me they have a purpose or power to change the outcome of the story. And in case you were wondering, yes, I found the ending to be as heartbreaking, depressing, and emotionally crushing as everyone else. The drama in this anime is the reason to watch it and stick with it until the end. I found myself guessing how things would turn out, praying I was wrong and that there would somehow still be a happy ending or a light at the end of the tunnel, but there isn't. It came when it did, I was never going to be ready for it, and it absolutely destroyed me when it arrived. The artistic visuals of the performances, the chemistry between Kosei and Kaori, and the powerful drama are what place Your Lie in April as my ninth current favorite anime. Attack on Titan Yes, I'm one of the millions of people who got sucked into this one by all the overwhelming hype and praise for it by absolutely everyone and their mother. And yes, I think it lives up to the hype, for the most part anyway. 
The choreographed animation and movement of the three-dimensional maneuver gear is intense and an absolute thrill to watch. The Titans are simply nightmare fuel in everything from their facial expressions to their sporadic movements. And the soundtrack is probably my favorite thing about this show. Attack on Titan also excels in one of my most cherished elements to any story, world building. I'm given just enough about the characters, the setting, and the reasoning as to why humanity is forced to either fight or run from these gargantuan creatures, yet I'm still left with so many questions that I feel compelled to continue watching and enjoy the ride as I patiently hope to find my answers. Characters will die, and they're very well aware of that. They know exactly the profession they're getting into, and yet it can still be horrifying to see how quickly certain characters can be killed off in the spur of the moment. You can't get attached to anyone really outside of the lead trio consisting of Eren, Mikasa, and Armin because they're the main characters, so I suppose they're entitled to even just a certain degree of plot armor. Everyone else in this is basically just a step above Titan fodder. They are important enough to have names, voices, and purpose, but they typically don't stick around for long. When I watch Attack on Titan, I get just as much excitement from witnessing the sheer bloodbath that every confrontation humanity has with the Titans as I attempt to guess who will live and who will die, alongside my overall enjoyment of the roller coaster that is the action itself. But for all of the brilliantly executed elements Attack on Titan has going for it, the reason it only comes in at the 8th position as opposed to anything higher is because as of this moment, the story is incomplete. We know a second season is coming, but whether or not it's actually good remains to be seen. It could be glorious, completely blow my expectations out of the water, and aggressively demand greater priority within my favoritism. Or it could just suck. Who knows? I wouldn't classify the state of in-progress as quite as much of a flaw as with something like Dead Man Wonderland, because it really isn't quite the same situation. The latter was cut short before it really got the chance to live up to its full potential. Attack on Titan, on the other hand, was given enough time to develop an enjoyable and complete first season. There are just some lingering questions we the fans would like answers to. Attack on Titan is fantastic right now, and it has the opportunity to get even better in Season 2. But until I know how Season 2 will fare, I can only discuss it based on my enjoyment of Season 1. That being, I enjoyed it quite a lot. But I think I will like this anime even more once I can look at it as a complete package. Soul Eater While I praise other entries on this list for having interesting, memorable stories, Soul Eater doesn't really have that. It's a generic academy premise with the main characters being students learning how to specialize in a certain skill and dealing with common school setting tropes as a result. But Soul Eater stands out to me, and probably millions of others as well, with its style, humor, characters, and action. I love the very Halloween-esque design of the characters and the world they live in. From a visual concept standpoint, the show is unlike any other anime I've seen, so if nothing else, Soul Eater has that going for it. But I also really like the concept of the Weapon Meister and Human Weapon Partnerships. It's a great way of not only expanding the supporting cast when it otherwise might have had half that amount in quantity, but it also gives a refreshing take on the idea of teamwork. The characters actually have to learn how to deal with each other's personalities and differences. It's not just about one character learning skills or techniques in order to master his or her weapon. That weapon is another person who can transform into the weapon. That character has to learn about a completely different person and trust them enough so that they become a perfectly synchronized duo under the illusion of a single person wielding a weapon. Of course, don't get the wrong idea. It might sound like I'm playing Soul Eater up to be this super heartwarming drama about friendship and finding strength through camaraderie, but no, that's actually not what this show is like at all. Not by a long shot. Soul Eater puts so much emphasis on having thrilling action sequences and completely off-the-wall, mind-numbing humor that my description of the weapon partnerships might almost be misleading, even though that's an aspect I personally enjoy quite a bit. The animation is so fluid and pleasing to watch, and when it's accompanied by such an upbeat urban soundtrack, hopefully you begin to see why people like this anime so much. There's so much adrenaline and personality in the battles that I could go back and watch them on their own without re-watching the entire series itself from start to finish, and still enjoy them just as much as I did on my first viewing. That's not to say that the story outside of the battles isn't enjoyable, though. There are plenty of moments where we learn more about the characters and the conflicts they face while learning to work with their respective partners, and these moments aren't bad. But again, Soul Eater isn't an anime that emphasizes emotions or having a deep plot. I can only really describe the humor of Soul Eater with one word, Excalibur. 
Now, if you haven't watched Soul Eater, you won't get the significance of that name. But if you have, you should know what I mean. The character Excalibur is such a mindfuck that his screen time, I feel, best captures what the comedy of Soul Eater is like. It's random, it's crazy, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, and it can be so downright stupid and ridiculous that it's funny on a more meta level. Death Note There are really just two elements about Death Note that I love. The first is the concept of the Death Note itself. The second is the constant psychological warfare that goes on between lead protagonist Light Yagami, acting under the alias of Kira, and the mysterious detective L over the course of the first arc. A common theme I have on this list is that I like these shows because most of them have some kind of hook or interesting premise that is simple to understand. Death Note is no different. The concept here is about a notebook that can kill people when their names are written within it, and the author can even decide how that person dies. When average high schooler Light comes across the book, he gradually develops a god complex as he uses the Death Note as a tool to punish criminals and other people he deems worthy of killing so that Light can create a more perfect world. The idea of the Death Note itself is so simple. It does have certain loopholes, restrictions, limitations, and exploits that come as part of the package, but in general, it's not hard to see how the show progresses the way it does. The concept of the Death Note is so straightforward that it's easy to see how granting people such a dangerous power as anonymous murder can corrupt them, and an ongoing theme in this anime is whether or not using the Death Note is morally just. Sure, it can be used to harshly punish the scum of society for their crimes or sins when the legal system might otherwise be unwilling to do so, but innocent people are just as vulnerable to the book's powers so it ultimately comes down to the mental sanity of the person wielding the Death Note that becomes the true threat. Anyone can use the book, so if it ends up in the wrong hands, or the person wielding it is not mentally stable, all hell can break loose at any time. Of course, the world doesn't just turn a blind eye to the sudden rise of mysterious, spontaneous deaths and murders committed by an unidentifiable murderer, and that's where my second favorite element comes in. Light uses the alias of Kira so that he can make his abilities known and feared by the world without his killings being traced back to him. And this catches the attention of L. From here, the entire series becomes an ongoing game of mental chess between Light and L. L is cunning, logical, and determined enough to track down Kira, while Light is always calculating strategies and analyses of L's behavior and thought process to keep him from discovering the truth. Over 80% of this anime takes place in the characters' minds as they think through every situation, consider every possible alternative, and make decisions about their next course of action based on every possible contingency, risk, and action that can be taken by other people involved. It's downright insane how thoroughly characters like Light and L examine each other in each situation. The tension comes in full swing every time L comes dangerously close to getting the answer he seeks. He considers the idea of Light being Kira more than a handful of times, and we as the viewers know that if he ever pursues that theory, this show will end. To me, Death Note essentially felt like it could have ended at any time, and I was never sure how soon or how far away that ending was. I never knew if L was ever going to finally piece it together, or if Light would find a way to kill him off before he figured it out. I've had to rewatch conversations multiple times just to make sense of what characters were thinking and why, because it can get pretty confusing if you're not paying attention. Death Note isn't an absolute masterpiece though, hence why it's only at number 6. The show can be a little ridiculous at times by making even the most basic activities, such as eating a potato chip, overwhelmingly intense to the point where it's downright laughable. And the less I have to say about the second act, the better. Without going in too deep, a certain character dies, and after that, the show just kind of takes a free fall in quality and never really picks itself back up after that. It drags itself on for so long that I kind of stopped watching it after a while. The series' conclusion isn't bad though, so if nothing else, I'd recommend skipping ahead to the very end once the second arc begins. One Punch Man when binge-watching anime in order to make this list, after a while I started to get a bit burned out, and all these amazing shows started to feel... kind of the same. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed each of them, hence why they're being talked about here in this video, but what I mean is that I started to find some recurring tropes. Stuff like the underdog protagonist, endless endurance to overcome hardships, rich, complex plots with heavy themes or intricate world-building. All of that stuff is great, 
but there comes a time when it all begins to feel a bit tiring to be subjecting myself to so much of it at once. I needed a break. I needed something different. One Punch Man was that difference. I can call this a parody of your typical action anime, and I wouldn't be using the term parody with negative connotations, but rather just because that simply is what it is and why it's awesome. One Punch Man is about a man who punches, and that one punch is literally all it takes to kill absolutely everything and anything that stands in his way. The premise and execution are over the top, the animation is so detailed and vibrant at times that it almost feels humorously unfitting for the context of the story itself, and even though the very idea of having a character who could overcome absolutely any adversary with the most minimalistic effort possible sounds like it would get boring or uninteresting, it's not. Trust me, this anime is insane in all the right ways. I almost can't express how refreshing it is after having to watch or think about so many action shows in such a short amount of time and then come across One Punch Man in all my research because it just feels like it makes fun of the very idea of serious action in anime. There is a supporting cast of other superheroes and villains besides protagonist Saitama, but we get so very little information about any of them besides their names, abilities, and perhaps even a hint at their backstories or motivations because in the grand scheme of things, they simply don't matter. Far more often than not, villains will not live long enough to see screen time beyond just one episode. They show up, preach about what they want or are going to do, the other heroes try to stop them but can't because plot, then Saitama shows up and settles the entire conflict in one punch. This cycle is repeated frequently over the course of the 12 episodes, but it surprisingly never feels stale or repetitive. I'm quite honestly compelled to just laugh at how consistently absurd the very premise of this show is. Because Saitama can overcome literally anything, you would think there's no conflict. Well, there is, but it's not in the typical anime style of protagonists starting out weak and vulnerable and growing over the course of the story. No, Saitama's struggles come from gripping with the reality that he is already at his peak potential and might never find any real challenge or threats to him because just about everyone else in the world around him is so weak that they die in one punch from him. The heavy emphasis on hero rankings and all the implications and stereotypes behind them also come into play and help carry things along so it doesn't feel like you're watching one episode 12 times over. One Punch Man is a unique experience. Even just within the context of this countdown, there is nothing else quite like it. It's not very long, but it doesn't need to be. It's very clear to understand, it wastes no time with character monologues or deep world building, and it just gets right to the point. Villain shows up, gloats, and dies in one punch from Saitama. That's all it is, and that's all it needs to be in order to be as awesome as it is. Definitely check this one out if you haven't already. Guren Lagan. You know, I almost couldn't get into this one at first just because of how loud and in-your-face it is. But as I stuck with it, I realized that that kind of attitude is exactly what makes it so great. Guren Lagan doesn't have consistently top-notch animation, and the story has a few low points along with all of the high ones. But when this show wants to assert itself and really show off, it does that in full force. I would describe the animation as intense, gritty, and sacrificing a certain degree of detail for the sake of being as flashy and over the top as possible. It's hard to not get excited while watching action scenes exploding in your face as frequently as they do in this anime. I wouldn't exactly say the show has a sophisticated narrative, it's essentially giant mechs fighting, a lot and I haven't seen enough shows like this to decide if I like the genre or not, but I enjoyed this one enough for it to at least make the list. That's not to say that Guren Lagan has no compelling story whatsoever. There's something more substantial here than I was expecting, which you'll discover too if you stick with it long enough. What I remember most about Guren Lagan is just how ridiculous it is in just about every aspect imaginable. It has a heavily recurring theme about learning to believe in you yourself first and foremost, regardless of whether or not anyone else does the same, and always striving to surpass your weaknesses, doubts, limitations, and struggles to always reach new heights. It's very uplifting to be sure, but this anime will beat you over the head with it until you remember it and take it to heart. I can't recall one single episode without this lesson being mentioned, if not emphasized. It came off as annoying to me at first, but amazingly, Guren Lagan kept pushing this lesson of believing in myself over and over and over again to the point where I just couldn't be irritated anymore, and instead I just felt compelled by it and utterly convinced of its importance. This show is so raw and untamed in all the right ways. Its morals will be repeated until they're firmly engraved in your memory, Yoko is fucking hot, 
there are a handful of moments where the show dials back the intensity to have more somber and heavy-hearted character growth. Yoko is fucking hot. The amount of detail on each and every mech is absurd for the visual blender that is the animation they will be subjected to in the copious amounts of fight scenes. Yoko is fucking hot. And the soundtrack is phenomenal. Also, did I mention that Yoko is really fucking hot? I don't think I did. Hmm? What? What do you mean she's 14? God damn- Naruto and Naruto Shippuden Okay, here it is. You knew it was coming. If you know me, you know I love Naruto. This wouldn't have been a list for me if he wasn't somewhere on here. But I'm not putting Naruto so high up on this list because I think it's that amazing of an anime, or that it's better than the other ones on this list who came before it. No, no, it's nothing like that, so please calm down. If nothing else, Naruto is just my nostalgia pick. It was one of the first anime I ever really got invested in, so if it hadn't been for this one, this video might not even exist because I wouldn't have cared about anime as much, if at all. But let's be clear about something. Naruto is a severely flawed anime. It has a ton of problems with pacing, balancing character development within its enormous cast, inconsistent animation quality, and the story takes a lot of turns that ultimately are strange and somewhat detrimental. I will not deny any of these problems, and I do feel that this series deserves a healthy amount of criticism for its flaws. Despite all the times where the show is at its worst, when it gets good, it really gets good. There are more than a handful of moments in this story that invigorate me, challenge me to think, and even move me to tears. The copious amounts of flashbacks and pace-breaking character monologues do detract from the quality of the show's storytelling. But in the moments when they aren't present, there's a really enjoyable storyline underneath it all. It's the tale of a boy born with almost nothing to his name but a curse, growing up isolated and hated for ever existing for reasons he isn't even aware of. This is the tale of how this child grows and learns and fights the world at every turn and races straight ahead into the blinding light of tomorrow armed only with an unbreakable spirit. Naruto is a character who lives for one single purpose for continuing to endure in the hell that is the world of the shinobi. He wants to become Hokage, the lead ninja, the individual who seeks to be acknowledged, respected, and loved by everyone around him. He wants to inspire his comrades, instill them with hope, passion, and courage to always stand and fight for what they believe in by challenging the very world that tries to shut them down. Naruto wanted to leave his mark on the world in such a way that he would never be forgotten, that his past could be erased and replaced with a present where he belonged in the world. Naruto was a character who always inspired me to endure my own hardships in my own life and to keep pushing on through them. He taught me to have faith in myself and believe in what is important to me. It didn't matter what anyone else did or said. I was only going to not get what I wanted the second I gave up. This one single character has left such an impact on me that as much as I do recognize the numerous flaws this anime has, I also find so much about it that is meaningful to me, so to an extent, I forgive it. That's not to say that the only thing I enjoyed about this anime was Naruto as a character. I mean, I didn't even like him at first. Like most people, I too found him to be incredibly annoying. And it takes a while before you start to like him. But when he has his moments where he demonstrates his unbreakable willpower, Naruto really does make this anime feel like it's worth watching. I feel the action was better in part 1 when there was more of a focus on the ninja aspect. There was a greater emphasis on survival, characters fought more physically instead of relying on these gigantic powers, and death was a bit rarer and had more immediate meaning and consequence to it. But I do feel that Shippuden fleshed out characters like Jiraiya, Shikamaru, and Itachi quite a lot and gave us so much more about them to look at and appreciate, even though I'm sure we all have a handful of characters whom we wish had gotten more screen time than they ultimately did. The scaling of Chakra starts to get a bit out of control as Shippuden progresses, and fights as a whole start to appear as though the show is trying to be like DBZ. Characters cared less about analyzing the situation carefully and acting methodically, and instead were just trying to kill each other as quickly as possible. Don't get me wrong, there were some fights like this that I did enjoy quite a lot, but there were just as many that I didn't because of this change in scope. The animation has its very, very low points, in addition to its high ones, which, again, I think are good enough that they help continue to make the show overall feel worthwhile. I wasn't too fond of the whole child of prophecy angle that gets introduced a good chunk of the way into Shippuden's story, because it just makes everything that Naruto does after that feel really forced. 
like he's not fighting the good fight and trying to change all these people because it's what he can do as a person, but rather just because the prophecy expects him to do it. The fourth Great Ninja War arc painfully dragged on for much, much longer than it probably needed to, and the whole talk no jutsu thing Naruto does with his enemies also gets really old after a while. I could believe Naruto being able to change the lives of two or maybe three villains at most, but the fact that he's able to do it to just about every single antagonist he meets gets really ridiculous, to the point where I think all the jokes about it are justified. On a more positive note, the ending was extremely well executed, and felt rewarding for just how much time I put into keeping up with this anime. It was nice to see this long-running series that I grew up with come out on top with a satisfying conclusion. Naruto as a series probably wouldn't get nearly as much hate as it does if it did certain things differently, and I have some ideas for how I think it could have been more enjoyable. I would love it if we one day saw it get some sort of DBZ Kai treatment, where the filler is removed and the animation is redone to be more consistent. Cut out all the fillers and flashbacks within the fights, and just about everywhere else in the story, and already I think the show would be that much more enjoyable because the pacing would be a lot better. Obviously, Naruto has a lot of problems. I don't blame anyone who can't sit through all of it because of those problems or doesn't like the series as a whole, and if any of the changes I talked about could be implemented, so much would have to be revised that I feel like this would be almost a completely different anime entirely. Regardless, I still stand by what I've said. Naruto was one of my inspirations growing up, and I've stuck with the show for so long that I take all of the bad along with the good, because I think the good parts are well done just enough to keep me around. If you don't agree, then look on the bright side. It's still only at the number 3 spot. Full Metal Alchemist For so many people, Full Metal Alchemist was a first real exposure to more meaningful anime. The kind that goes a step beyond what you typically expect from the shonen juggernauts. It was my first real exposure as well. Now, Full Metal Alchemist is a shonen as well, but the difference between this and something like Naruto, One Piece, or Bleach is that it isn't a long-running anime. It only has about 50 episodes, while the other three examples I just listed can have episodes stretching into the hundreds. Because Full Metal Alchemist is so much shorter, the quality isn't stretched out and is instead more consistent all around. The animation, the pacing, and just about everything else in between. Out of all the anime on this list, this was the hardest one for me to talk about, because it was just that difficult to find the right words. If I could use only one single term to describe this show overall, that word would be brilliant and I feel it best comes into play when I'm talking about the world building more than anything else. Full Metal Alchemist creates one of the most fascinating, breathtaking, and artistically unmatched animated worlds I've ever witnessed. But I don't just mean that it has a great art direction or that the backgrounds are nice to look at. Both of those are definitely true, but my praise doesn't stop there. FMA is composed of all these exceptionally well-crafted elements. The overwhelming variety in its characters, the gripping action sequences, the concept of alchemy and all of the principles, consequences, beliefs, both logical and religious alike, and implications that come along with its very existence. Armed with the straightforward yet never overbearing goal of finding a Philosopher's Stone and undoing the great tragedy they have committed, the Elric brothers embark on an adventure that takes them through one of the most exciting, methodical, and simply heartbreaking journeys you'll find of all the anime that everyone simply must watch before they die. Full Metal Alchemist is an anime I feel almost unqualified to speak of because it has been around long enough for so many people to have discovered it, experienced it, and taken something completely different away from it. I could pull out a thesaurus and list off all these praising synonyms, but I'd only be wasting time. I could never do this show justice simply by talking about all the many ways it succeeds and moves me. I could almost describe Full Metal Alchemist as a sort of gateway for new anime fans into a vast new genre of quality entertainment that this medium has to offer. But if you care about anime enough at all to still be watching this video, you most likely have already seen FMA, you know why it's so good, and everything I'm saying is just regurgitating what you already know or are already thinking. And if you haven't seen it, well then stop watching this video right now and go do it. Go watch it. It's worth your time, I promise. Notice, however, that I listed this entry as the original 2003 adaptation. I bring this up simply because I know the comment section would otherwise if I didn't do so myself. I have watched Brotherhood. I think it's good, it's great, it's fantastic, and I see why people prefer it. I do like both adaptations of Full Metal Alchemist, but if I was forced to choose only one, 
I have to go with the 2003 version. I know a lot of people don't really care for its ending since it deviated away from the source material and came up with its own conclusion. But I actually enjoyed that conclusion because it was so different. Brotherhood's ending feels a lot more like the satisfying happily ever after that these characters deserve after everything they've been through over the course of the series. But 2003's ending isn't so cut and dry. It demonstrates that sometimes people don't always get that perfect happy ending. That's about as specific as I want to go because I simply can't bear the thought of spoiling it for those one or two people who haven't watched the anime and are watching this video right now. Again, go watch it. But what I'm getting at here is that I appreciate the contrast. I do still love Brotherhood for its greater emphasis on action and more satisfying ending, but I love the story that the 2003 version told just a little bit more. And of course, to each his own. We don't need to turn this into a war. Let's just agree that we all have our preferences, but it doesn't matter which one is better because, as a whole, this series is just so damn good. Here we go! Come on, you knew this was coming. Alright, alright, I'll give you the real number one. Hunter Hunter. This one was such a pleasant surprise in so many ways. The protagonist Gon looks and talks like your typical shonen anime lead with an outrageous hairstyle and unbridled enthusiasm for adventure. But that's all in concept. In execution, he's so much more. Gon is never annoying or preachy about his aspirations like someone like Naruto. He acknowledges his strengths along with his weaknesses. Gon respects his opponents and his rivals for who they are as individuals and everything they know and can do so much better than him. The hardships and suffering of this world leave a very real and almost terrifying impression on Gon after enough time has passed, but this is not something he didn't fully deny. He embarked on this journey knowing full well what dangers and challenges lie ahead. And despite the ways they try to tear him down, Gon possesses this unwavering passion for training and growth. He has a goal of finding his missing father, but he never beats you over the head with it. Gon can still be very practical and down to earth. He's one of the most balanced child protagonists I've ever seen, and in that regard, he's more like Aang than Naruto. Gon is a protagonist I can genuinely root for, but he's only one of the ways Hunter x Hunter surprised me. I never expected his best friend Kilua to go from a laid-back, outrageously overpowered child assassin to a genuinely flawed and likable character. The first arc of this anime reminded me so much of Naruto's Chunin exam arc, but I never expected it to get as brutal, unpredictable, and downright exciting as it is. And that was only the first season. Hunter x Hunter shares that distinct, mysterious world-building style that I love about Fullmetal Alchemist, or even to an extent, Steven Universe. We only learn more about this world in small increments as the story progresses, and it never progresses in quite the same way from arc to arc. There's always a new location, a new threat, and new adventure to be found, and all of it has been amazingly well crafted so far. I say so far because at the time of this recording, the anime isn't even finished yet. Hunter x Hunter is an absolute thrill. There's not a single character so far I haven't liked to some capacity, be they protagonist or antagonist, because they're all so well crafted. The animation is consistently enjoyable, and once you reach the point in the story where the concept of Nen is introduced, the world building, action scenes, principles, and ideals in the show just open up dramatically. There's so much about the show that I still don't quite understand, and that's not always because I haven't been given all the details yet. Sometimes it's because the powers, politics, and history in this anime are so rich and complex that you really can't just sit back and watch passively, or else you'll surely miss something. Hunter x Hunter can be just as thought-provoking and brilliant as Full Metal Alchemist, and even though it reminds me a lot of Naruto, it does some of Naruto's strengths so much better. Gon is able to earn the respect of others through his determination, but he's a lot less preachy and loud than Naruto. Hisoka is a better Orochimaru than, well, Orochimaru. Hell, all the antagonists on this show get more screen time and character growth than half the cast of Naruto. And Nen is a hell of a lot more complicated and versatile, than something like Chakra any day. I'm trying to keep the comparisons down to a minimum here, but I just can't help it. The similarities I found are half the reason I got so drawn into watching this anime in the first place. 
The other half was just from hearing how amazing it is as a whole. My only real nitpick with Hunter x Hunter so far is that I wish Kurapika got more screen time, because he kind of disappeared after his arc with the Phantom Troop and hasn't really come back prominently into the show since then. He's one of my favorite characters because even though he's a character being driven by vengeance over the murder of his people, he's nowhere near as edgy as Sasuke, and he actually has a decent human personality. Kurapika's quest for vengeance doesn't stop him from making friends and having fun every now and then. He's a lot more balanced in his priorities, and I really want to see more of him. Otherwise, I'd say Hunter x Hunter lives up to all the praise I've seen it get. The spirit of adventure shines bright, and the road to making Gon's dream of becoming a hunter and meeting up with his father is filled with danger, sorrow, and pure wonder. It's easily my current favorite anime. So what are some of your favorite anime? You can suggest some ones that you think I should check out next, but I'd appreciate it if you phrased it more nicely than just complaining and calling my list shit just because X anime wasn't already here. Thanks for watching. This has been Brawlmaster012, signing off.